I would like to commend Stephen Spencer. The speech he just gave was very clever. He was, uh, he kind of introduced the, the possibility of thinking well about the way we we're doing and then said, ah, hang on, it's not really that way. So our first speaker has worked for many of the UK's most prestigious retail, tourism and hospitality brands, including Hamleys, the Royal Collection, Historic Royal Palaces, the National Trust for Scotland, the O2, and the Science Museum Group. Today he's going to tell us what is wrong with the standard definition of customer service and why this matters to every organisation and what we need to do about it. Having distilled the experience of 25 years and 30 million customers into his positive customer experience programme, Stephen works with organisations to create positive experiences for teams and customers, leading to positive business results. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Spencer. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. Right. That's better. Can, can you see me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Do you feel like I'm engaging with you and you're possibly going to get what you came for today? Yes. Good. <laughs> not, uh, not quite so enthusiastic as the first two, but we'll see how we get on. One of the most interesting things about Stephen's speech was making us realise that we know about bad customer service already from our own daily experience. And being able just to think through how we can change and adapt what our companies do and to look at what we do in the light of the customer. As professional speakers, we all know that when we're at work, we're on stage literally on stage, but also in our social media prof uh, profile and presence, um, via email, uh, on the phone, in client meetings. Whenever we're at work, we're representing our personal brand, our business, our philosophy, and we're delivering with enthusiasm our business solutions to our clients. Would you agree? Yeah. So would you also agree, then, that great service underpins great business. Yeah, good, okay. Well, you would think that's the case, but actually I've got some news for you. First of all, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is, did you know that in a global survey of aspirational nation brands, we rank number three in the world, and we have done so for many of the last 20 years that this uh, survey has been running? That's great, isn't it? Because that means that more people want to visit Great Britain and spend money here than any other country in the world apart from Germany and the USA. We're in the top three, isn't that great? However, there is bad news. Because in the same survey for quality of welcome, the experience people have, we rank only number 11. Last year it was even worse, we were 13, but in the last 20 years we've consistently been outside the top 10 for our quality of welcome. So that means more people are coming or want to come, but when they come they don't necessarily have just as good an experience as they should. And that can't be good for business, can it? Now there was one year when actually we did rather well. We actually got into the top 10. We were number 7 in the world. Would anyone like to hazard a guess which year that was? 2012. Yes, it was the year that we hosted the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and didn't we do well? The venues were fantastic, the service was seamless. People spoke about the whole atmosphere, particularly in London, but around all of the venues and in the country as a whole. We delivered, and didn't our athletes deliver as well? So superbly. And the thing that I think made all that come together, it wasn't just the quality of the venues and the quality of the organisation, it was enthusiasm. It was a shared enthusiasm for showcasing how great our country is when it's at its best and how great our people are. Would you agree? Yeah. So why does this matter? Well, a survey by the Walker Research Consultancy shows that by 2020, customer experience 
will be the number one differentiator, the number one influencer of decision making when it comes to customer buying behavior. It will not only be outranking product and price, it'll be outranking product and price put together. So that means that by 2020, if not before, the businesses that win will be those that put customer experience first, those that lose will be those that just compete on product and price. Now, is it really as bad as I'm saying? Well, I'd just like to tell you a quick story. I went shopping the other day and uh, I bought a house. I didn't uh, go shopping to buy the house. I bought a house about six months ago. It's what Phil and Kirsty would call a doer-upper. We've all seen those home shows, haven't we? Homes under the hammer. One of the perks of working from home is homes under the hammer. And location, location. <laughs> And it always has a happy ending, doesn't it? People buy a wreck of a house, and it all looks very daunting, but in a four weeks, they've turned it around, they've transformed it, they've turned it into a cosy home, and they either decide to live in it, or they sell it, and they make loads of money. It's great, isn't it? Well, mine, after six months of hard labor, <laughs> I'm rather inclined to call a do a downer. <laughs> but anyway, on this particular day, I went shopping, and uh, I was on a mission. I was looking for white goods. I was looking for furniture. I was looking for accessories. Everything to turn my wreck of a house into a cosy home. And I went to six furniture superstores, two DIY sheds, a garden center, and a department store home store. So 10 stores over several hours. And I just want to share with you the interactions that I had with team members. First of all, a nervous looking youth. He had ignored me the first time. Second time I passed through the bathroom department, he said, uh, can I help you? Anyone care to hazard a guess what I said? <laughs> no, thank you. Just instinctively. Second, I was admiring a range cooker, a beautiful range cooker, classic design, lovely styling, lovely lines beautiful knobs and dials. And this natty little salesman, sort of career salesman, came over. He said, hello, sir. He said, I see you're looking at this model. There's just one thing I'd like to tell you about this model, he said. Um, it's got that little rail across the front. See that little rail? He said, you can't really see the knobs and dials, can you? Because that little rail. He said, that's all I'm going to tell you. And that was all he told me. <laughs> then he went and sat down. The third interaction was with a crumpled middle-aged man sat at a desk. I walked into the showroom. He looked up and said, you will let me know if I can help you, won't you? That's what he said. His body language actually said, please don't want anything because I might have to get up. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, was the sum total of the great British retail industry's attempt to satisfy my dreams, to give me the experience I was looking for, to realize my ambition of having a cozy home. So I believe that there's something that needs to be done about this. How do we literally turn the tables, turn that man's little desk? It was his office on the shop floor, his comfort zone. How do we turn it into his stage? His stage for delivering his brand with pride, with enthusiasm, and giving me the experience that I actually wanted. There's a very simple model that I believe can transform any business into a customer-centric one. It has five elements. I call it the customer experience model. The first element is leadership. Now, this can apply to speakers and individuals as well as global corporations. How do you uh, convey your enthusiasm for what you do and what it can do for your customer so that your customers and your team, who are your most important customers, can follow you. And when I talk about teams, I'm also talking about partners, stakeholders, bureaus, anyone that represents your brand. Second is the setting. Literally your stage, the physical or the virtual environment where the experience takes place. Third is the customer who must be served. Fourth is the team that must bring the experience to life. And fifth, and most often ignored, the fifth element are the processes that underpin the experience. So, for example, how do you create, maintain, and enhance 
the setting for your experience. How do you do business with your customers? Do you make it easy for them to do business with you? Is the way you do business based on your aspirations, your limitations, or their aspirations to have an easy, positive experience? How do you recruit, retain, train, inspire, engage team members who will enhance your brand and deliver the experience? If you put this model at the heart of what you do, I believe you will become a customer-centric business and you will create your own London 2012 effect that won't dissipate after the games are over. Now, a very, very quick story to end with. I did have a positive experience with my um, house renovation journey. It came from a man called Christian. He delivers um, and fits uh, wood-burning stoves. He came on the appointed day to deliver the stoves that I'd ordered, and I left him to it. But before I left him to it, he said something that will always resonate with me. He said, because I want you to be over the moon with your purchase, I'll come back when it suits you and show you how to get the very best out of it. I love that he said that. When he'd fitted the stove, he sent me a picture. There it was, glowing away at the center of my home. Marvelous. Then he phoned me up and said, it's all fine. He said, except I did damage the hearth while I was fitting it. Oh, OK. I, I said, yeah, OK, fine, fine. I'll sort that out. No, he said, I've, I found some lime render. I fixed it. And he said, I hunted around. I found the tin of paint that you'd use to paint the hearth, and I've repainted it. <laughs> that business, and I'm going to name check it here, because this is how it works, Stove Tech of Oxford, they're set up not just to deliver a product at the right price at the right time, but the right experience. I'm going to close with a quote from uh, a fellow customer experience professional, Mark Hurst. I love this. It sums up what I want to say. He said, did you know that your company has a team that's responsible for managing the customer experience? That team's name is the whole company. I hope this has been instructive. Uh, meanwhile, if you'll excuse me, I just need to sit down because my feet are killing me. Um, but you will let me know if you want anything, won't you? <laughs> Thank you very much. Stephen Spencer's talk was absolutely superb. He's got a way of connecting with the audience and telling a story that actually connects it to the business world. What was clever about his speech was that the way in which he showed us, allowed us, the audience, to decide for ourselves the point that he was making. And that's clever. That's a clever way to use persuasion in a speech. So I commend Stephen Spencer. I'm Philip Kampani of the PSA. I really enjoyed listening to his customer service examples because it brought it to life and it gave me something really to take away from it. So often we get involved in our own products and services, we forget what the experience of the customer is. And we have to look at that forensically and really aim to make it exceptional. And that is what Stephen's talk did for me today. So if you're looking for a speaker that wants to engage the audience and have real takeaways, then I would suggest you hire Stephen Spencer.